So um, the blockchain itself is a distributed ledger. It's like a database that exists on multiple computers at the same time and that can be um, verified through cryptographic signatures so that all of those databases are in sync. This panel is not going to be about the aesthetic value of NFTs. Um, you know, are monkey JPEGs as good as Namjoon Paik? It's also not about the economic impact of NFTs. Do, uh, does this new crypto economy of Web3 promise a more egalitarian art world, or is it reinforcing the same hierarchies? It's also not going to be about the environmental impact of blockchain, which is a significant topic and one we just don't have time to deal with today. You want to go to the next slide. We're going to start by saying some assumptions. Um, we're going to assume the following are myths. NFT standards typically involve storing art assets on the blockchain, a very common misperception. The blockchain actually only accommodates uh, most blockchains a very small amount of data. So instead, what is stored there is a record that then points to indirectly a media asset, such as an image or a sound file or a movie file that's elsewhere on the internet. That's not true of every work. And we will try to focus today on works that have much of their kind of mechanism on chain. But it must be said that uh, starting off, that is not true of most works. Um, secondly, um, NFT contracts typically transfer rights to media. No, they don't. So whereas there are exceptions, in most cases, the copyright to the original artwork is not transferred along with the NFT. The NFT is just a token that lets you invest in something that you can sell later or support the artist in other ways. It is not typically transferring the rights to the work itself, or at least the media uh, files. NFTs help establish clear, verifiable provenance. Um, this is also, I think, an illusion that has been promoted by crypto crusaders, uh, where you can see very clearly who sold what over time. That is certainly um, a promise, but you have to remember that the wallets, the digital sort of um, currencies that people use to transact in NFTs can be synonymous. So it's not necessarily clear who is buying what from when and the, and the platforms that NFTs are sold on often obscure this. Finally, adding art to blockchain preserves it for the future. Um, this is a common misunderstanding as well and one we're gonna tackle directly. Some things, however, we do assume a reality. Some creators are registering technically and conceptually rigorous artwork to the blockchain, and those are worth preserving. So that's an assumption we're making based on the works that we've reviewed. Also, there are no official standards for conserving artwork that includes distributed ledgers like blockchains. We're really kind of out on the frontier here trying to figure things out. Um, so we're gonna do that in a couple of steps. You wanna go to the next slide? Uh, first, Regina, uh, uh, an independent uh, conservator who's worked with numerous NFT projects and crypto artists, is going to talk about medium-specific preservation issues, particularly focus on, focusing on a couple of case studies that are really um, people who have been trailblazers in this field. Then John, myself, I'm going to focus on medium-independent preservation issues, how we think a little bit broader about solving the problem of blockchain-based art. Can it be preserved? And finally, John Bell is going to focus in on one of those solutions, namely emulation. Take it away, Regina. Thanks, John. I often hear that non-fungible tokens are simply receipts and that they have little bearing on the preservation of the often off-chain visual and sonic assets that comprise the artwork. First of all, calling an NFT a receipt for those assets implies that you bought the visual and sonic asset. Um, to begin with, which from a legal perspective, I don't even mean the copyright. I mean, just for the artwork, you only have ownership over the on-chain data, but that's another talk. On the topic of this panel, to dismiss all artwork registered to the blockchain or dismiss learning about the underlying infrastructure of various distributed ledger protocols that have arisen since 2009, it ignores the future needs of an important subset of artists that have been utilizing the components and behaviors of blockchain in the literal performative behaviors of their work. Yes, this isn't the majority, but the most rigorous challenging works that consider media specificity may very well be what is acquired by museums and was ultimately canonized over more populist fully off-chain works registered to the blockchain. I picked four of many examples to speak about high level, two of which we'll dive a little deeper into. In all cases, I will only uh, talk about elements that are relevant to this topic, not the literary influences or um, art historical interpretations of each work. 
The first example is going to show that there are artists participating in the more speculative side of the market who are also making works that have on-chain elements. This is Mad Dog Jones Replicator, for example, in the bottom left corner. Uh, Replicator is a work that performs a set of actions over the course of a year. The code base, which is hosted centrally on a server that Mad Dog Jones maintains, creates a set of what we call paper jams or jams. Every time there's a jam in the code, which uh, it's designed to have six, but it's somewhat unbeknownst to the artist when exactly that jam will happen over the year, the off-chain server needs to communicate with the Ethereum blockchain to mint additional NFTs that move the narrative along in this office motif we see in the bottom, or really the copying machine forward. For John F. Simon Jr. in the second example on the lower right, um, this is for every icon NFT. Some of you may be familiar with the multiple versions of every icon that have been produced since 1996. The artist was inspired by the promises, false or otherwise, of blockchain technology and created a version that would be fully or mostly encoded on chain in the smart contract. So there's enough data in the smart contract itself with the help of a team called Divergence who are based in London to reconstruct the artwork and the bitmap for a specific image and the prime, that the primary collector had a chance to choose off chain. Its existence on chain is conceptually relevant to the work. For the two examples we'll discuss a little bit further, both the McCoys and Rhea Myers have been contemplating the media specificity of blockchain well before the existence of NFTs, which didn't officially come into existence until 2018, quite literally a protocol written by the creators of CryptoKitties, and in which they specifically, among many things, said that art was a motivation in that original proposal. Rio was already experimenting with Ethereum protocols in 2014 before it officially launched the public in 2015. And she was also making works for other chains, including Bitcoin and derivatives at this time. Kevin McCoy often claims to be the first artist to mint a work on the blockchain, particularly the name coin derivative in 2014. Although some of us have come to understand that there are artists registering works with the blockchain even earlier than Kevin, with evidence going back to 2013. That said, both artists, Rhea Myers and McCoys, were already approaching these chains as an emerging technology to experiment with, in my eyes, no different than any artist curious about an emerging technology and not for the speculative or profit motive reasons that many think. So next slide, please. So what exactly is Meyer to Myers token equals text? Rhea conceived of the token ID on-chain metadata being translatable from a string of numbers into a specific English language text. The unique cryptographic hash generated upon minting the non-fungible token would then determine the color using a translation from the first three bytes of that data. To view this without having to manually translate the information yourself, Rhea did create a dApp or decentralized application off-chain that communicates with the Ethereum blockchain via a Web3 JavaScript library fetching the state and then doing the work of turning it into the image you see here. But you technically do not need the off-chain application. For example, you could reconstruct the English language portion of the text by taking the token ID, translating the decimals into hexadecimals, and then hexadecimal into ASCII, and you would have the same text. But there's also another aspect of the work that makes it uniquely intrinsic to the chain. The concept of the work is in part related to various smart contract protocols, in this case the more typical non-fungible smart contract protocol that most people use, and a less adopted Ethereum smart contract extension. This extension would allow singular group transactions of multiple typical smart contracts to be bundled together. This is particularly important for understanding the work because each individual token is a fragment of a larger text piece that can only come together if uh, it is in this uh, bundled version of the smart contract extension. Next slide, please. For Kevin and Jennifer McCoy's quantum leap from 2021, there are some parallels to the other works mentioned, including Replicator. Visually and sonically, Replicator is not on-chain. It's a series of premeditated videos released after those paper jams occur on-chain. Quantum Leap is a WebGL-based visual and has also been stored as video. It's meant to be primarily interacted with and viewed through a React application that connects to a collector's digital wallet. The work also uses JavaScript in part to communicate with Ethereum blockchain data, just like Rhea's. And before anyone cringes too much about the WebGL and JavaScript libraries off-chain, not to mention React.js, the McCoys are open to migration on this side. And to me, although not exactly a walk in the park to conserve, we have the mental and tangible toolkit 
collectively to handle that uh, aspect of it, right? But not really for the blockchain for, I guess, anybody in the audience, I'm assuming. The JavaScript library is communicating with the Ethereum uh, smart contract via an Infura node, a reminder that most individuals interacting with blockchains are actually doing it in a not so decentralized way, instead relying on companies that run the nodes for them. Infura is owned by Consensus, the same company that also created the most popular digital wallet that's being used with these blockchains, MetaMask. That said, the on-chain data for the work holds two key parameters that are being fetched, a timestamp and set of integers that determine, that determine the current and next phase for the mandala-like primordial star you see here, and that's what they call it. The on-chain data will trigger the off-chain vis visualizer to do one of three things, to keep the same state, enter a transitional state, which is like a dying star, it starts desaturating in color, and then finally the death of that star is what you see on the right here. When the star dies, collectors have the option to trigger an on-chain rebirth function that shifts the timestamp in the integer and also produces two additional NFTs that don't change in state but act as bookmarks, as Kevin calls them, to refer back to the dead star visualizer and one other previous state of the star, kind of like, you know, just as a reference point. Not everyone who receives Quantum Leap will reach the death of a star more than once in a three-year cycle, but there are technically up to eight possible cycles, and therefore one individual could have up to 64 separate NFTs produced over that three-year period. Next slide. Now, before we get into the preservation of the works with on-chain code and behaviors, I want to also mention that I've been doing technical artist questionnaires, manuals, advising on primary archival files, web copies, exhibition copies, readme text, checksums, etc., and other preventive documentation that are packaged for collectors buying work via these blockchains on or off-chain. And a lot of the artists need help with this now, not waiting until an archive or museum down the line shows interest in acquiring it, but when the work is still in production or super fresh in the artist's mind. This is why we need you to also understand these technical things with blockchain. So next slide. Either way, how do we begin considering preservation of an on-chain behavioral element in tandem with off-chain components, or even for works like every icon NFT at least, which intended to essentially be fully on-chain? One solution goes back to node operators. Most individual node operators, at least on Ethereum, not to mention the large majority that run the companies like Infura, have strong cryptocurrency profit motives, we know this. But one day, a new shiny object will come in the tech industry, and whatever that may be, those not node operators en masse may abandon uh, upholding the ledger, leading to its collapse. Just yesterday, I looked at the global node operators we have on Ethereum, and there's only 2,000 currently. That's really low. That's scary low. I believe at its height, there were at least 12,000. A solution would be for archives and museums to form a, consor a consortium of sorts where they each run a full node, including an archival node, not incentivized by cryptocurrency by any means, but to uphold the ledger for the purpose of reactivating these works following necessary hardware specifications, which I have on the right here, uh, the left here. This is not nearly as energy intensive as mining. I just do wanna put that forward. But there may be other solutions beyond upholding the actual live distributed virtual machine, which John Apolito and John Bell will discuss. Thanks, Regina. That's really scary, 2000 Ethereum uh, node operators for this global supposedly uh, ironclad system. John, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so uh, people abandoning the network uh, and, and not uh, sustaining the nodes of a peer-to-peer -peer system like blockchain is a fear. There's a lot of other fears too. And an easy way to get a sense of them is to look at the fine print of the Christie's conditions of sale for a high profile auction like the Warhol NFTs, the digital NFTs that just um, occurred last year. And this is literally just a list from their own contract, right? So um, individuals can forget the, the, the special cryptographic keys they need to access their wallet. Um, there are a series of different ways that um, blockchains can be vulnerable to attacks from um, bad actors who wanna kind of take over the chain and make it do its bidding. Um, and uh, rather than go in detail at all of these, let's just say that what options do we have? Let's suppose that we do want to preserve works that have been created using blockchain. What can we do besides um, just watch it expire? John, if you want to go to the next slide. Well, fortunately, we have precedents for this, right? In net art, you know, which is going to be a subject of some of the talks uh, tomorrow, artists have created uh, 
things that are parallel uh, examples to blockchain. So on the left, you have John F. Simon Jr., the same artist that Regina mentioned, created a work for the Guggenheim called Unfolding Object, a box, a virtual box that you could unfold in kind of an infinite number of, of sort of panels. And every time you a, a new person unfolded one of these works, and again, it's a single website online, but everyone accesses it differently, there'd be a new crosshatch, a new kind of mark on that particular panel. Um, and this was a way of sort of recording the actions of, of viewers and, and participants in the work in perpetuity, which means if the work ever needed to be recreated, you'd have to ask yourself questions about how to represent the traces of previous viewers. That's comparable to the idea of a blockchain. Each block in the sequence contains references to the blocks before it. That's how it is secured cryptographically. There is a hash as the technical term that allows um, every block to sort of contain seeds of the previous blocks and make sure that they are in fact validated as new blocks are added to the chain. So it's a comparable problem. Like how would you recreate something that itself depends on past interactions? On the right, you have Keith Obadika's Blackness for Sale, an example of so-called auction art from around the turn of the century. This was another sort of genre of internet art in which people started to challenge the idea of ownership by creating strange versions of things, like in this case, um, this artist's own ethnicity or racial uh, uh, identity, people uh, auctioned off their body parts and so forth. And it was a way of sort of um, changing the terms of what ownership of an artwork meant. So that's another uh, precedent we can look at. John, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Variable media strategies were created in part to address slippery artworks like this, right? So the variable media paradigm offers four possible general directions to move in preserving a work. Storage, keep it the same, make it you know, fixed to the wall, preserve it in amber. Those are the solutions that have the least change. Migration is the one we're most familiar with from traditional uh, uh, you know, archiving theory where we take a work that was in, you know, WordStar and move it to WordPerfect and then move that to Word and then move that to Google Docs. And every time we lose a little something, but our hope is that we, when moving to the up-to-date technology, we keep it alive. Emulation is a, more of the new kid on the block where uh, a new system makes, uh, a, a sort of impersonates an older obsolete technology. It's a very powerful idea. And finally, reinterpretation is really taking the most artistic license with an original work. And I've been really pleased to see this morning a lot of examples of artists reinterpreting archives as a form of keeping those alive. Next. So when we look at how we might apply those strategies to a blockchain that's abandoned or crippled in some way, the obvious example from storage is to let it expire, and that may be appropriate for some works. In the cases of the artists that we talked to in preparation for today's panel, they were like, no, don't let it die. That's you know definitely not an acceptable option. Freezing it would be to say, well, okay, the 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 maybe the um, you know blockchain is collapsing, but before it does, we're gonna take one snapshot of it and essentially preserve that one block. And so you'll no longer be able to interact with those works but it will represent a snapshot in time of the blockchain. And none of the artists like freezing it either. The most um, preferred option of the artists we queried was sustaining it. So in this case, an institution like a museum would have to maintain their own nodes. And Regina alluded to the idea of, you know, maybe you want to join the 2000 nodes anyway, just to keep the darn thing going. But in this case, you might actually have to take over from this global network and instead support it through uh, an institutional network of say Ethereum nodes that you maintain yourself. Next. So sustaining is a nice idea and it's very popular with the artists, but I'm not sure how there, there are hidden costs and potential problems with, uh, with museums doing that. Um, so what other options are there? Well, migration again is the most common idea. And um, one of the artists uh, suggested this might be a possibility. If, a, if a, a blockchain looks like it's on the way out, it's gonna die off for technical or political reasons then uh, what you could do is essentially transfer the artworks to a temporary, what we call a paper wallet, which is essentially uh, um, a static version where you write down the cryptographic keys required to access that token, and then sort of insert that into another chain, right? So um, you can imagine this happening in two versions of the same sort of cryptocurrency blockchain like Ethereum, or you can imagine it happening, um, translating from say the Ethereum blockchain to a Tezos blockchain, 
uh, that might outlive the former one. So um, this is a complicated one involving the sort of handoff between two chains. I'm not cl clear myself how much of the original data that's important would make it into the new chain, but it is an option that one of the artists recommended. Next. The third option that I think is actually really interesting, but was not, uh, not suggested by any of the artists is emulation. And this, I, again, is the idea of sort of recreating a version that simulates somehow what the original chain was. So one option would be literally to reset a chain. Well, no one liked that idea to go back and erase the history of this, you know, what's touted as a, as a permanent historical record. Forking the chain, well, that's a little different because that means that you preserve the history up to the point at which one of the chains, you know, kind of goes bad and the other one continues where it was before. Um, the Ethereum network actually did this in the past. They forked uh, between an, uh, a bad direction that the Ethereum blockchain was going and a new uh, Ethereum, which is now those kind of standard ones. So there is some precedent there. And finally, continuing would be to sort of like let the first chain die off and then start over once it has gone and kind of move forward from that. To talk about the technical details, uh, John Bell has been thinking about how that might play out in practice. Thanks, John. So, yeah, and one of the things I want to start out with here, talking about the technology, is what exactly it is that the artists themselves are looking at. Um, there is an assumption in many cases that uh, because they're playing with the deep sort of protocols that are, that are part of the blockchain, uh, that there's a lot of information available to them. Uh, this is a screenshot from the documentation for Solidity, one of the dev tools that's often used for making this kind of artwork. Uh, I thought it was really interesting that they basically say, no, don't worry about it. Uh, because that is the assumption in many programming circles at this point, that there's so much sort of history and libraries and stacks and, and all of these things that are beyond the scope of the immediate project that just assume that they're going to work. That's great until they, they don't. So uh, what I would like to, to introduce here is a walkthrough, essentially taking a case study from the tokens equal text piece that uh, Regina introduced and say, what would it actually take in order to fully emulate this? Doesn't mean that that's necessarily the best decision uh, in every case, but what would it actually take? So what does this ecosystem look like in order to create an NFT-based artwork, in this case, the tokens equal text? Uh, so there's a couple of components to it. There is the blockchain and the Ethereum virtual machine itself, the thing that runs all of the tokens and nodes. There is the custom code that is part of the application, part of the artwork. There are often off-chain dependencies, in this case uh, being stored in uh, IPFS, another uh, decentralized way of storing files online. And then there's the actual user client side of things. Um, this broad overview of the, the, the live system is necessary to think about what is it that we're actually going to reconstruct here. So I'm going to break each of those pieces down a little bit further. To begin with, when we talk about the blockchain, what are we actually talking about here? Uh, and how could it be recreated without it just being that big cloud thing off in the, the internet somewhere? Uh, the blockchain consists of Ethereum nodes that uh, run Ethereum uh, virtual machines, EVMs. Uh, it also consists of the blockchain data itself. In many cases, and there's a, a number of different technologies you can use to actually build out those individual EVMs or, uh, and nodes and, and run them, uh, there are ways to uh, encapsulate the entire server uh, functionality in a uh, container that you can make portable between different pieces of hardware. And this is often how it's distributed. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at a particular uh, Ethereum node implementation called Geth. Uh, this runs, or it can be distributed at least on a Docker node. Uh, Docker nodes, you can think of as sort of lightweight virtual machines. So once you have one of these Docker images in place, you can create as many of those as you want and put them together on the same piece of hardware and have them communicate with one another. Uh, it should be said that this is not necessarily trivial because there is a pretty decent hardware allowance required to underlie all of this 
and each of these nodes needs its own copy of the chain. Uh, so it can stack quickly, but it can also stack between institutions as uh, Regina suggested earlier. So it doesn't necessarily have to all be on a single institution. Uh, so that's the, the chain that is accessing. What about the artwork itself? Uh, if you think of the chain data as essentially, and this is not always the case, but it's often the case, storing variables that are then read by uh, an external piece of software in order to render or to, uh, to deliver the piece to a particular viewer. What does that external software look like that's reading the variables out of the blockchain? Well, uh, in this case, it's custom code that is uh, web-based. So there's an Apache server. Uh, there's the actual rendering uh, engine itself that is incorporating the web three JS uh, library that Regina mentioned. Uh, and then there's the underlying software, but there's also a number of external dependencies that are part of this too. So because this is a web application, it's incredibly common in web application space to have these outside calls. Uh, in this case, it includes jQuery, Google fonts, and some IPFS resources, potentially, not necessarily in this case. But the reason that I want to highlight that is because there is, uh, those IPFS resources need to be treated a little bit differently than say the jQuery or, or the Google font, uh, because the underlying network in IPFS is a little bit more complicated than just loading a file. And of course, there's also the actual ownership associated with a particular Ethereum uh, token. The viewer part is a little bit simpler, but we need to consider all the pieces here if we're saying that we're going to try to reconstruct this in some distant unknown future. So we need to not just have the Ethereum token itself uh, and a way to uh, store it in a wallet, but we need the viewing software, which in this case is a web browser right now, uh, we potentially need an underlying operating system or to, or to run all of this so that you don't have an outdated version of Firefox and no longer runs. These are the typical problems that you would see anyways in, in uh, preservation of a web-based artwork. So this isn't necessarily different, but there are additional concerns to keep in mind. Uh, now, if you break all those individual pieces apart, some of them are more important to contain and to uh, retain on your own. Some of them you can kind of depend upon the web in order to uh, go reaccess them in the future. Uh, but I'm just going here from what is most central to the artwork. So the purchase token and the unique assets, what is a little bit less common or, or it's critical to the artwork, but it's not necessarily embedded in it, the network dependencies. And then you can go as far down the rabbit hole as you really want. Uh, what I will call out here though, is that you can make Docker instances for that reconstruct all of the cloud uh, portions of the, the uh, system that I was talking about earlier. So if you put all of this together, then you can run your own virtual machine with a number of those Docker instances to reconstruct both the blockchain and IPFS storage if you want to. Uh, you can have another virtual machine that has the artwork on it and include all of those dependencies that you capture uh, early on in the life of the work. And you can have multiple client machines potentially connecting to them so long as you have the actual copies of the, the artwork itself. Uh, this does leave a few open questions though. Uh, one of them is just whether transactions are actually emulatable in a meaningful way. Uh, if the point of the artwork is to be out on a public chain, then pulling it, making that chain private, does that compromise the work? Um, there might be technical problems bringing that public blockchain into the private space. Uh, when exactly do you do this? This gets into the different strategies that uh, John mentioned before around uh, trying to either recreate or continue a blockchain that may be dying in some way. Uh, can you just take the data out of the tokens and move it over? This is similar to that paper concept, uh, paper wallet concept that John mentioned. And uh, what exactly are you going to do with it? Um, just because you have a copy or a snapshot of a blockchain at any given time, 
most of these works are intended to be time or duration based in some way. The ones that we're uh, talking about in some, in a sense, they bring the concept of the transaction into the work. Um, how are you going to emulate that? When are you going to take it from the, the beginning of the chain or the end? Um, so this isn't really providing a set solution. This is not a template, but it is a way to create the underlying infrastructure that allows you to then ask those more conceptual questions and pull a piece of the chain in to uh, keep going in perpetuity. So with that, I believe we're at the end of our presentation. So if there are any questions, I believe we're ready for them. Yeah, first a uh, round of applause for this. Um... Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, yeah. So, so thank you. That was a rousing applause and applause. And we, 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 thank, we thank you, of course, uh, for this um, um, brilliant conceptual ideas of, of uh, preservation. And John, I remember visiting you by the end of the 90s. I think it was in the Guggenheim where you were doing already pioneering work. And same today with uh, Re Regina and, and John. And uh, so, and, and I like how you draw the line. Um, from the variable media questionnaire to the blockchain storage strategies, all of you um, mentioning migration, emulation, reunification. And um, yeah, and so my question is, well, I have one question to John and one uh, to Regina and also for the others, of course. Um, do you see, um, if, if we consider the traditional digital art what, at this point still, not in most of the cases is lost, would uh, your strategy be applicable for an individual institution like one museum or do we need a kind of a network for that? And to, to Regina, <clears throat> um, since you seem to have a good overview on the developments in this in this field, um, are there also, so what you, um, what are for you in your mind, uh, are there, can you, um, uh, uh, yeah, give us an idea, Is, are there are also content wise, interesting tendencies about like where artists deal with climate or surveillance or like with other topics of our time or is it mostly really only with uh, the code? <clears throat> Sorry, was that John, me or John Napoleon? I'd, uh, I'd like to hear John's answer. <laughs> John <Dalton>. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think it is within the scope of an individual institution to do that. I think it will be more robust and a better simulation of what was trying to, to uh, exist in the past with the actual blockchain to distribute across multiple institutions. Um, it, it, but yeah, that is all technically within the, the purview of one institution if you wanted to commit the resources to it. Um, it's not... Uh, inconsiderable amount of resources, but it's also not a truly massive uh, number of resources. Um, the other thing that I would add there is that um, I think the, the question of having an individual institution take ownership of all of this, uh, once they have the, the blockchain emulated, so let's say that you have three emulated uh, Ethereum nodes, um, you're not just backing a single artwork with that infrastructure. If you're collecting a number of different Ethereum-based artworks, and once you have those three nodes running, then you're covered for the Ethereum component of all of that. So it's not like you have to do this for every individual work that you're collecting. That's right. That's right. And I agree completely. It could be three nodes across multiple institutions that are willing to dedicate the hardware, or it could be a thousand, I mean, ideally, um, to just continue upholding this ledger. And I think John was alluding to this a little, you're upholding, if you go that route, this like live, just like full node hosting, you're hosting the entire history of that ledger period from the beginning of 
time. Um, it's, that's what the consensus is. Um, but to the point, if I understand your question correctly about content that could be collected or, you know, works that are interesting outside of just like code base works on chain. Um, there absolutely are institutions right now considering not just works that have behavioral performative elements involved the blockchain, but also um, conceptual and social and historical uh, commentaries around this technology. Um, a good example is a show that is in San Francisco right now at Minnesota Projects uh, with Bitforms Gallery. Um, Claudia Hart, an artist, curated it. And the show's about digital combines. It's this concept of how do you take, uh, one of the works, for example, is on wood, right? And it's just about like writing into the metadata that the NFT points to that, you know, to sell this NFT conceptually, um, you need to include this tangible, tr more traditional object with that NFT. So those works are also, um, you know, I think a, what museum, a museum in Russia showed this work as well. So like there are institutions that are considering those kind of conceptual ideas around the topic of blockchain outside of this uh, more niche scope that we discussed today that has uh, larger preservation implications. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions? I assume there are questions here in the audience on this hot issue. Okay. I have one question. Since uh, token money uh, is not like a fiat money that it's uh, based on the coin, uh, token money is a closed system. So you are talking about the closed system. Have you uh, done the research to put it in the to conjunction? Because if you look through the history, uh, usually when the issue of money comes into art, it's a time of crisis. Sorry, yeah, so, so um, I, I think the, so the mining aspect of it can be isolated to some degree, given the system that we're talking about here. Running a Ethereum node does not necessarily mean that it's a mining node. There can be uh, different types of nodes that you uh, want to run on your own internal system. Um, I think actually mining introduces some potential opportunities to do interesting things, uh, just in terms of how do you reconstruct things like um, gas taxes, which we didn't talk about, which are, are involved in uh, supporting ongoing uh, transactions on the chains. Um, once you start to reconstruct those and make them more specific to particular artworks, then uh, that not only helps bring you back closer to the original work, but it also provides new opportunities for people to interact with the piece in slightly different ways and, and to conceptualize their interaction with the piece in slightly different ways. Um, so I think that it's hard to get away from the mining question with these particular works because it is on the public uh, network right now and that is intrinsically part of how it's being presented. Uh, but if you want to for purely archival purposes you can just eliminate that completely. And I just quickly wanted to say that like if we look at the utility of any emerging technology throughout history, there were use cases outside of the arts. It's like uh, artists are choosing to utilize these technologies, at least this uh, subset we're speaking about, in these conceptual experimental ways that don't necessitate or even sometimes make commentaries on the financialization. That's just what's been the hot topic for everybody to talk about. So we should look back and go, what are the other technologies that artists have been experimenting with throughout history that had other financial use cases, you know, um, it's kind of, to me, like uh, separate concepts. I would also say that um, this is a, this is one of the things that I think is interesting about uh, blockchain art is that it does allow us to challenge or explore new models of ownership and, and collectorship from enforcing royalties to, um, you know, the one of the artists that we talked to has a piece where the work has to always have the same sale value. And that would be impossible to enforce in, you know, auction houses and normal gallery secondary sales. Um, it was something that Saul Lewitt tried uh, with his democratic drawings, which were supposed to sell for $100 a piece. But how do you enforce that? Well, if you're selling an NFT, there's code that enforces that. And, you know, Rhea Myers literally uh, created a piece like that. So 
I, I think there are huge problems with the motivation behind current, uh, cryptocurrencies and the economic inequalities that result from them. But as an artistic medium, they uh, do offer possibilities that are hard to achieve otherwise. Unfortunately, we're running out of time already. So thank you again for your brilliant contribution. Another applause here from the... See you soon, hopefully. Bye. Thank you to all. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, everybody.